What is up everyone? I am TST's The Mud Man. It's time to figure out what we are going to play this weekend ranked in Gods Unchained on a budget. That's right, this video is going to be entirely budget friendly. What we're going to do is we're going to start off like normal. We're going to talk about god popularity and the most uh, popular archetypes for each god so you have a good you know, guess on what you're going to be playing when you queue into you know, various gods this weekend. After that, we're going to take a look at a handful of just really good neutral uh, budget cards that you can put into essentially any budget deck, as well as discuss some like very general like budget versus non-budget meta stuff. And then finally, we will take a look at a deck from each god that's uh, budget friendly. The decks will range from about $15 USD to just under $55 USD. So the decks are far more obtainable than uh, you know your average deck that you would see in this series. But uh, before we go into anything, if you are not a budget player, if you have a full collection or money is not an issue for you, check out last week's video. We go into excruciating detail about the best decks in the meta. We talk about a couple of different control war decks, a couple different control light decks. And there have been no balance patches between this week and last week, no new archetypes discovered. So all the information from last week's video is just as relevant now as it was then. So if you're not a budget player and you do want some information about the uh, you know, the meta from a full collection perspective, then uh, check out that video. You can find it in the What to Play Over the Weekend playlist um, on this channel, or you can just scroll to the end of this channel where you'll be met with a link to last week's video. But now let's jump right into it. So we're on GUDEX.com looking at the Mythic Meta by God Popularity over the past seven days. And as you can see, War is still on top. In fact, War has become even more popular this week than it was last week, making up over 30% of all games played in Mythic Rank this past week. Um, Control War is definitely the strongest of the War archetypes. However, Aggro War is by far the most popular. Aggro War makes up about like 23-ish percent of all games played, so you will definitely be running into a lot of Aggro War this weekend. The second most popular god is Deception, and Deception's most popular archetype and their strongest archetype is Aggro Deception or Hidden Rush Deception, whatever you want to call it. Um, control Deception also exists. It's just generally not as good at controlling as the other control decks are, and uh, it does have Cutthroat for good value, but it doesn't have, it's not like as value oriented as something like light or, you know, control light rather. Um, whereas Hidden Rush Deception has a pretty good matchup against a lot of popular archetypes in Mythic Meta right now. So when you run into Deception this weekend, it will most likely be Aggro Deception. Uh, then we have Nature. Nature's most popular archetype is still Control Nature. Like aggressive, wild nature does exist. However, as you can surmise from nature's location in god popularity, nature is a very middling god. Control nature is not as good as control war or control light. Um, aggro nature is nowhere near as good as zoo light or aggro war. So it's just, you know, it's a very middling god at the moment. And then we have light. And uh, despite the fact that light is not the most popular god, it's quite popular in the meta. Zoo light is the second most popular archetype in the game, representing about 10% of all games played in Mythic Rank. Um, similar to war, control light is the stronger of the light archetypes, but zoo light is far, far more popular. Uh, then we move down into death. Death can either be zombies or Anubians. Anubians are the more popular of the archetypes this week. Both archetypes are actually you know, quite budget friendly, neither of which are particularly powerful. But like I say every week, if you see your death opponent picks a Soulburn God Power, it means they're zombies. If they pick the Blood Ritual God Power, then they are probably Anubians. And now we have the least popular God in Magic. Magic is predominantly control magic. However, um, you know, Tempo Magic has been seeing a bit of a resurgence in the past week. A few players have been playing Tempo Magic or Card Draw Magic, whatever you want to call it, and it's been performing rather well. So you'll probably see more tempo-oriented Magic decks this week than you know, you're accustomed to seeing. That being said, Magic is the least popular god, so you might not see any Magic decks this weekend. But with all that being said, let's take a look at some good, cheap, neutral cards that you might want to think about adding to your budget-friendly decks. Alright, so before we take a look at any decks, let's go over a few really good budget-friendly neutral cards that you can consider for pretty much any uh, budget-oriented deck. Um, a lot of the cards will be pretty obvious, but you know, I think it's probably smart to go over them anyway. The first card I want to talk about is Vanguard Axelman. This card is very common at all ranks of Gods Unchained. It's a very strong card for very obvious reasons, so 1 mana 2-2, two, two, so normal stats for a 1 mana creature. It has Blitz, which is great for just controlling the board state. It's advantageous if you're an aggro deck. It's good if you're a control deck. It's just good pretty much all the time. 
So uh, if you are a budget-oriented player, or if you're just a Gods Unchained player in general, you probably want to at least think about putting Vanguard Action in any of your decks. Uh, the next one I'd like to go over is Wild Hog. Wild Hog, uh, another very strong neutral card, one mana, two, three, so slightly overstated for its stat line. It does have the downside of being confused. However, it survives a trade from Vanguard Axelman. It's, you know, a lot of creatures in the early game have two attack, so having three health means you can either trade into two creatures or you can just survive an attack pretty easily. Um, I was considering putting a card like Netherborn Binder on this list as well. Netherborn Binder is just a couple of bucks, so it's definitely not going to break the bank. It has the same stat line as Wild Hog. It doesn't have Confuse. It has its own downside. But uh, realistically, Wild Hog and Netherborn Binder fit pretty much the exact same niche. In fact, Wild Hog is better in nature most of the time. And uh, Wild Hog is absolutely free. It's a welcome set card, so everybody has it. Uh, the next one and the first non-welcome set card I want to go over is Encumbered Looter. Encumbered Looter is a 2-mana two 2-1 two with Hidden and Afterlife Draw card. The Afterlife Draw card is very strong, so it always at least cycles itself. So if you're a control deck, it's good for you know, trading up. If you're an aggro deck, it can deal some damage, it can draw you a card. It's just you know a very solid card in general. Having Encumbered Looter in your deck is definitely not weakening it. Uh, the next cards I want to talk about are Bronze Servant as well as Iron Tooth Goblin. Iron Tooth Goblin is a Genesis card, so it's much more expensive than Bronze Servant. However, it's only a couple of bucks, so it's not going to be too expensive. And also, you usually only need one piece of relic removal, so you can buy just a single Iron Tooth Goblin. Bronze Servant is a core card, so it's much cheaper. Um, you know, it's arguably free if you're willing to grind out those core packs. The reason why I have Iron Tooth Goblin on the list at all is because Iron Tooth Goblin destroys 3 durability from your opponent's relic, which is very relevant when dealing with relics like uh, Lysander Spear or Moonlight Charm or like Palace's Wand, whereas Bronze Servant is incapable of destroying those relics just by itself. It is good at dealing with like any of War's relics or any of Death relics, however. And uh, also, you definitely don't need a relic removal in all of your decks, but um, relic removal is fairly common, and if you want it, these are some you know, very good neutral options. The next card to go over is Feral Shapeshifter. Feral Shapeshifter is in a lot of Gods and Chain decks, like budget decks and otherwise. It's a very strong card. It's a 4-mana 4-4 four, four with Hidden, so it's very difficult to remove. It has 4 attack, which means it's not being destroyed by Blade of White Flames, which is very common at Mythic rank. Um, there's a lot of creatures with 3 health, which is very good for trading into. And the fact that it Hidden means it can stick around, so if you're an aggro deck like um, Aggro War or Zoo Light, it's a prime candidate for being buffed because it's hard to interact with, so it'll probably stick around long enough for you to buff it. Uh, the next card is Guild Enforcer, which used to be a very, very popular card. Since the introduction of Blade of White Plains, Guild Enforcer has fallen off a lot in popularity because it just gets destroyed by Blade of White Plains on curve. However, Blade of White Plains is a very expensive card. Not every player has it, and uh, Guild Enforcer is really only weak to Blade of White Plains. The reason it was in pretty much every single deck before Blade existed is because it was incredibly hard to deal with. Um, it doesn't have Hidden, but because of its armor and its high health total, it also is a creature that survives a lot, so it's great for, you know, buffing up with, you know, your Canonizes or your Another Round, you know, whatever buff card you have. It's great for Hidden Rush Deception because you can, um, Orpheo is distracted every single turn, and the one armor mitigates the one damage you're dealing. So it's a, a very solid card. It's obviously very, very weak to Blade of White Plains, but Blade of White Plains, however, like, very strong and common in Mythic rank, not every player has it. So, Guild Enforcer is a, a strong inclusion for any budget-friendly deck. Uh, and now we have uh, Parfirion, the Dread Cyclops. This is a, uh, a legendary card, however, it is core, so you can get it you know, technically for free if you're willing to grind out those core packs, and since it's a core card by nature, it's not particularly expensive. Um, Parfirion is a very solid creature. A 5-mana five 5-4 five, are very decent stats. It has Ward, so it's difficult to remove. And its effect that makes your opponent's god power cost two more to cast is very, very annoying. Like, a lot of different decks, especially aggro decks, like to utilize their god power. And gods like uh, Nature and Magic and Deception often like to use their god power in order to pop ward. And Parfurion sort of protects itself from, you know, the god power popping its ward. It's a very solid creature. Uh, next up, we have Shady Bruiser, which is very similar to uh, the Feral Shapeshifter. He's a high static creature with Hidden. So he's hard to remove, and he deals a lot of damage. Another creature that's just a premium buff target. If you hit this with another round, all of a sudden you're dealing 9 damage to your opponent's face. It's very, very strong. And the final card I want to go over is Kaya, the Conduit of the Gods. Kaya is a neutral 6-man 5-2, so its stats are pretty abysmal. 
However, it deals damage at the end of the turn based on how much mana you spent this turn. So uh, it's it's pretty just good all the time. If you need it to clear your opponent's board, it's capable of doing that. If you need to finish off your opponent with a lot of damage, it's capable of doing that. And of course, its effect is ongoing. So if your opponent doesn't remove it, you can continue to get that powerful Kaya effect. Um, yeah, so Kaya is just, it's really flexible. You know, it's good offensively, it's good defensively, and it demands an answer. It's a very strong neutral card that you can you know, think about putting in any of your decks. So you may have noticed that Kaya is the most um, expensive creature mana-wise that I went over. And that's because I think if you are a budget player and you're using budget decks, you should avoid um, cards and strategies that involve being at 7 mana. Um, mostly because, at least at Mythic rank, when you get to 7 mana, you're going to be seeing a lot of Demogorgons and a lot of Therials, and there simply aren't budget-friendly cards that can compete with that. Like, um, you know, if you're trying to make, like, a nature deck that's going to compete, you know, at 7 mana, and you put, like, Sage of Renewal in there for value, Sage of Renewal is so much worse than Therial, it's not even comparable, and you'll just lose that value matchup every single time. And if you're trying to be defensive with something like, um, like a City Planner, City Planner doesn't really hold a candle to Demogorgon. So if you're a budget player, I think it's best to just avoid 7 mana as much as possible, because you simply aren't going to be able to compete with those you know, very powerful cards like Demo and Burial. So realistically, I think if you're a budget player, unless your deck involves like an OTK that you know Demos and Burials don't care about, um, you should probably go for aggressive or tempo-based strategies that try to close out the game before 7 mana, so you don't have to deal with those incredibly polarizing cards. But now that we've gone over these neutral cards, let's take a look at some budget decks that you might want to play this weekend. Alright, let's start things off with the best and most popular god in war. This is an aggro war list, and uh, before we talk about the deck, let me just explain myself a little bit. You will notice throughout all of these uh, like deck profiles that many of the decks have zero games played. And that is because I found high-performing decks that were only expensive because they had cards like uh, Blades of White Plains or Pyramid Wardens in them. I then removed those expensive cards and replaced them with more budget-friendly alternatives. So uh, despite the fact that no games have been played, these decks all have uh, tried-and-true strategies. And all of the decks that I you know, use as you know, like baselines for the, the budget decks that I made, all of them had a minimum of 66% win rates or higher. So um, all the decks, despite the fact that they have no games played, they should work, you know, quite well. So this is Aggro War. If you've been playing Gods Unchained for the past couple of weeks, you are definitely familiar with Aggro War. It uses a pretty simple strategy. You play creatures quickly, you buff them, you go face, and you do lots of damage. We have some strong early game creatures. There's the Valkyrie which can be buffed you know, very effectively with Battle Bard. In fact, you'll find many, many Vikings in this deck all capable of being buffed by the Battle Bard. And uh, instead of just going down the list, I want to you know, touch on Thundercaller first. Thundercaller is an extremely powerful card in these aggro war lists. In fact, in most games where I'm playing aggro war, my strategy is play a one-mana creature on turn one, go face with said one-mana creature, and then pip into Thundercaller. Thundercaller is a three-mana three-three, that buffs your strongest Viking at the end of your turn as long as you're frenzied. Since you are an aggro deck, you should be frenzied every single turn, and Thundercaller will usually be buffing itself, so if you play it on turn 2, it'll come down as essentially a 4-4 that grows every single turn, and if your opponent doesn't remove it the turn it's played, it's going to get bigger and harder to remove with each passing turn. It's very, very strong. Um, obviously, we have some of our Blitz creatures to control the board, so you can protect your important creatures and continue going face. We have Tavern Brawler, a classic Blitz creature. We have the Vanguard Axelman, a very strong early game Blitz creature. Relics aren't technically Blitz creatures, but they fill a similar role. They can go face, or they can trade away your opponent's creatures and protecting your important creatures. We also have Vicious Rend in here, which is predominantly just here for more burst damage. However, it can be used to trade away a damaged creature if you need it. Um, we have you know more powerful tempo-based creatures. We have the... Valka's Captain, which is a very decently statted 2-mana creature. If you're frenzied, you get a 2-1 Relic, which is good for going face or for removing your opponent's side of the board. Uh, we have our Death Swarm Raider, which buffs up any of your early game Vikings. Like I just said, we have very many early game Vikings for you to stick your Death Swarm Raider on. You know, it makes them, it gives them more health, it gives them more attack, they're more threatening and they're better at trading. It's just a very solid creature. Um, Death Swarm Raider's stat line isn't amazing. He has, like, two mana stats for a three mana creature, but his buff does make him worthwhile. 
Um, we have two copies of Raid Reveler. Raid Reveler is really strong. It's you know great for destroying like nature's creatures. There's a lot of three health creatures in the early game, and this can trade into it very effectively. The protected makes it hard to remove, and it's a three mana creature with protected. So since it's difficult to remove, it's a great candidate for being another rounded, which is one of your you know stronger cards, really capitalizing on your powerful board state. Uh, since we're talking about another round, we might as well mention the Feral Shapeshifter. Like I said when we were talking about good and neutral cards just a minute ago, Feral Shapeshifter is a very strong another round candidate. You can pip him out on turn four and then play another round. Uh, uh, sorry, you can pip him out on turn three and then play another round on turn four and just start going face and buffing the remaining creatures in your hand. Uh, the final and most expensive card in the deck is the White Fur Guard, which is just a very strong creature for its stat line. You'll mostly be playing it for its empower effect, so it'll be a 5-mana five 5-4 five with frontline and protected. The protected makes it difficult to remove and makes it so it can you know, trade into creatures very effectively. And at 5 uh, attack, it's very threatening, especially if you can buff it up with another round. Uh, just a good high threat creature that your opponent is forced to deal with because of that frontline. Um, let's see, other important cards. We have the Woodcutter Imp. This card's great. If you're playing against something like Zoo Light, it's great for trades in the early game, or it can just finish off your opponent. With two copies of Woodcutter Imp and two copies of Vicious Rend, you have a you have potentially a lot of in-hand burst damage that your opponent will not be playing around. It can be very, very destructive. Um, yeah, but that's about it for Aggro War. Like I said, the strategy is simple. You know, spend all your mana every single turn. You know, play creatures, go face, look for that Thunder Caller plus one drop in the mulligan. It's very, very strong. Stick your another round and you know overwhelm your opponent. Uh, but that's it for that. Let's check out the next budget deck on the list. Alright, and now we have Hidden Rush Deception. And this is actually the same uh, budget Hidden Rush Deception deck that we featured in last week's What to Play over the weekend video. And uh, Hidden Rush Deception is a very simple deck, but it's quite strong in the meta currently. Uh, the first thing I want to go over is, as you can see, this deck is right around $50 USD, which is on the, the higher side of the spectrum. Um, in price for this video. Um, the main reason why the deck is so expensive is because of Shadow of Lethanon. Um, Shadow of Lethanon fluctuates from between about like $15 to $16 USD, which means $32 of this entire deck is dedicated to just Shadow of Lethanon, which is more than half of the deck's uh, USD value. Um, however, Shadow of Lethanon is extremely important, especially in the meta right now. Um, the meta is very aggro heavy. The, mo the three most popular archetypes in the game right now are uh, first Aggro War, then Zoo Light, and finally Hidden Rush Deception. When you are playing against other aggro decks with Hidden Rush Deception, your best strategy is to simply outrace them. And your best you know, method for outracing your aggro opponents is playing a Shadow of Lethnon early and then giving it a knife and just continuing to go face with it until your opponent explodes. And that's basically your strategy for you know, the entire deck. You have a lot of uh, low mana value creatures. Almost all of them are hidden. You play your hidden creatures, your opponent can't interact with them, you buff your hidden creatures, you keep your important hidden creatures hidden with your Orpheus Distraction God Power, or with something like Assassin's Aim, which not only hides a creature, but also makes them bigger. And you just, you know, continue going face until, you know, like I said, your opponent explodes. And um, Hidden Rush Deception is pretty strong in the meta right now. Um, Aggro War is the most popular god. The Aggro War Hidden Rush Deception matchup is mostly a toss-up. It's going to come down a lot to who goes first and who has the stronger opening hand. But um, in the aggro versus aggro matchup, hidden is very important because aggro decks like to take value trades and you know they like to take favorable trades so they can maintain their dominant board state. And uh, since your creatures are hidden, you're, you will be the player who's always initiating the trades, which means that you'll be taking value trades and your opponent won't, which is very, very important. The war matchup, they have a lot of protected creatures, which are hard to trade into. They have relics, which you obviously can't trade into. So they are capable of outracing you. That being said, nothing can outrace a cat plus you know two knives. So you are capable of going extremely fast. But um, uh, Aggro Deception is particularly good in the Zoo Light matchup, Zoo Light being the second most popular archetype in Mythic rank. And Zoo Light hates Hidden Rush Deception. Zoo Light is all about making a wide board, buffing their board incrementally, and taking value trades. And since your creatures are hidden, your light opponent will never be able to initiate the value trades, and you will always be the one making trades, if trading is even necessary. 
And on top of that, despite the fact that Light is known for buffing its creatures, it buffs their creatures far slower. It usually buffs, you know, one or more creatures plus one attack at a time. You are usually buffing your creatures plus three attack at a time. And Light has virtually, or you know, Zoo Light rather, has virtually no way of interacting with hidden creatures. So they will not be making any value trades, and they really like making value trades. Um, historically, Hidden Rush Deception has just annihilated Zoo Light. Um, Zoo Light's not as popular as it used to be. Like I said in the beginning of the video, it represents about 10% of the Mythic meta. Um, Agro War represents over 20% of the Mythic meta. And uh, it's definitely not a horrible matchup against Agro War, but like I said, um, a lot of it's going to come down to who goes first and who has the better opening hand. If you do end up going second, it's not a completely unlosable situation. Maybe you get both your armor lurkers. Those are great for maintaining the board state. Maybe you get both your stone skins and you can just turn off their important creatures. Maybe you get a strong umber arrow. So, uh, you know, in conclusion, I think Hidden Rush Deception is uh, like very powerful in the meta right now. Unfortunately, it has like a base like USD cost of at least $32 because of those Shadow of Lethanons. But like I said, I don't think the Lethanons are replaceable. And, uh, you know, besides that, it's, you know, a simple strategy. Like I said, you play hidden creatures, you buff hidden creatures. You have the surprise delivery, which represents some like very slow burst damage. It's also really good in those aggro matchups. Again, Zoo Light, you limit them to only three you know, creature slots on their board. The same is true with Aggro War. It's more um, applicable for Zoo Light. Zoo Light really likes having a wide board, whereas War can go tall. But uh, limiting the amount of creatures they have is you know, very powerful, obviously. Um, we have the Lokian Disciple, which is very strong against um, Aggro War. Lokian Disciple's effect is whatever it attacks goes to sleep, so it can go face, you can rehide it, and then your aggro war opponent can no longer use their relic, which is very relevant. Um, Arms Dealer represents your only like AoE buff card. It increases the strength of all of your creatures by one. You do lose one mana in the process. The initial Arms Dealer, the 4 mana 3 3 one, is obviously a very slow tempo play. He's going to be hard to play because you would need 6 mana to play him and your Orpheus Distraction God Power, and oftentimes you'll want to be just, you know, distracting whatever your biggest creature is. However, the echo creature he creates is very, very playable. It's easy to weave in, you know, one mana to get that hidden 1-1 one, one that subsequently buffs your entire board. Um, I guess some other important cards of note is we do have the Lethal Prowler for your final burst finisher. Lethal Prowler is really strong in Hidden Rush Deception because all of your stuff is hidden, which means the turn you play Lethal Prowler, you're probably going to have something on the board that can go face and then, you know, deal that extra 5 damage of Burst. Um, all in all, I think Hidden Rush Deception is a very strong deck in the meta right now, and you will finish your weekend run in a record time. And uh, I think a deck like this should do very well in this weekend ranked event. Alright, and now we have Wild Nature. And this deck didn't need any modification by me. This was made by Cloud Haze. And uh, like I said in the beginning of this video, I think Nature is a very middling god at the moment. From an aggro perspective, I think Aggro War, Hidden Rush Deception, and Zoo Light are all superior to Wild Nature at the moment. But uh, Wild Nature is you know, definitely a fine aggro deck, so if you like playing Nature and you want to you know, play some aggro Nature, it shouldn't do horribly, just not as good as its you know, other counterparts. But um, you know, this is another aggressive, curve-centric deck. It uses the same strategy as you know, all the other decks we've talked about so far. Um, if you are getting bored of aggro decks, don't worry. The magic deck that we have at the end is not an aggro deck, so stay tuned for that. But back to the nature, your strategy is much like the other decks we've talked about. You're trying to play creatures in the early game. You're going to buff them up and try to overwhelm your opponent. There are some very important key cards for this deck, uh, most notably Dagon. And Dagon is one of the reasons why this deck is so expensive. Dagon represents about $17 of this deck's cost. Finian Fruit Bear is the other most expensive card in this deck. This card uh, you know, fluctuates from between like $12 to $15. Um, you can probably get away with dropping the Finian Fruit Bear if you really wanted to. However, the Dagon is incredibly necessary. Because just like I said when we were talking about aggro deception, the best way to beat your fellow aggro opponents is to out-aggro them. And Dagon really facilitates making a very strong board state in the early game. Considering your primary early game creatures are uh, Marshwalker, your Beetle, as well as your Jaguar. Um, all creatures you're capable of playing on turn one, all of them have regen. And um, you know any creature with regen can capitalize very heavily on Dagon's effect. After a creature is healed, it gets plus one, plus one. If you didn't know, regen also counts as healing. 
So the Dagon is key for making your difficult to remove but not particularly threatening creatures like your Marsh Walker and your Beetle into very hard to kill creatures that threaten a lot of damage and can potentially continue to grow if the Dagon sticks around. Uh, Finian Fruit Bear, the other most expensive card in the deck, fills a similar role. If your friend is at the end of your turn, you summon a 1-1 one, one Vibrant Fruit. The Fruit's Act Life effect gives your strongest creature plus 1 plus 1. So similar to Dagon, if the Finian Fruit Bear is left you know, unanswered, it will continue to buff the strongest creature on the board. However, Finian Fruit Bear is usually stuck as a 2-2, which means he's fairly easy to remove, whereas Dagon gets bigger every single turn as long as he can trade into something. So the, the Dagon, similar to the Thundercaller from the War deck, is a card that if you don't remove it, it becomes very difficult to remove and you know buffs your entire board state pretty much indefinitely. Uh, besides that, we have you know some generally strong creatures. We mentioned the Marsh Walkers, the Beetles, and the Jaguars. You have your Fey Flame Blade to help control the board state. There's a lot of protected creatures floating around with both Light and Aggro War. Fey Flame Blade is very good for popping those protected bubbles. Uh, we have Celestial Stag, which is just like a decent creature on its own. 3 mana 3-3 three, three is a you know a fairly decent body. Its blessed effect is fairly strong in the aggro versus aggro matchups because you'll be getting more favor, which means that you'll be able to pick from the Sanctum first so you can pick the best card and deny your opponent that potentially strong card. Um, also, it can potentially generate you a random nature card every single turn as long as you have a creature to play alongside of it. And considering the curve of your deck, you should always have a cheap creature that you can pair with your Celestial Stag as long as it survives. Um, we have Lightning Strike, which is very important for destroying Pyramid Wardens and Demogorgons and uh, Guild Enforcers, all that type of stuff. We have two copies of Bladefly to just instantly go wide on the board, so you can potentially buff it the turn after with Wildfire. Wildfire is probably the strongest swing card in your deck. You deal one damage to your opponent's entire side of the board, which is mostly irrelevant unless you're playing against Aggro Deception but you also buff all of your wild creatures and give them more regen, which makes them harder to remove and it makes them all more threatening. It's easy to wrap your head around why Wildfire is good. Uh, we have two copies of Bale Warden Minotaur, which are just decently sized creatures for their mana cost. They also generate you a seven mana wild creature if you end up going into the late game. Uh, Vicious Manticore is you know, a strong creature. Its blitz means it has immediate impact on the board so you can get rid of you know, an important creature your opponent has. And then it, uh, it has Overkill as well, which is good for either dealing damage to your opponent's face or dealing with multiple creatures at the same time. And its Frenzy effect deals 3 damage to your opponent's god, you know, providing your Frenzied. And with this creature's Overkill, it should probably be activating Frenzy on its own, which is quite powerful. And then you can have that little bit more burst damage. Um, our most expensive card in the deck is two copies of Sudden Bloom. Sudden Bloom is both a finisher card and a board clear card. If you activate Frenzy, it gives you know one of your creatures plus four plus four, overkill and twin strike. Overkill and twin strike means that you should probably be able to clear your opponent's board regardless of its size, and plus four plus four is a very sizable buff, so whatever creature you stick the sudden bloom on will become very, very threatening. And when you talk about sudden bloom, you have to mention the feral shapeshifter, which is probably the most common sudden bloom target. Just like we, what we said when we were talking about War, you can play Feral Shapeshifter. It's very hard to interact with because of the hidden. You can then activate Frenzy with an existing creature, or maybe a Fey Flame Blade, then drop your Sudden Bloom, and all of a sudden you have an 8 attack creature with Twin Strike and um, Overkill. So you can either destroy your opponent or destroy their board. It is a very powerful effect. Um, as you can see, Cloud Haze here has played about 40 games with a nearly 60% win rate which is very respectable. So if you want to play Nature this weekend on a budget, I think a deck like Cloud Hazes here could be a very good choice for you. All right, and next up we have Zoo Light. Zoo Light has been a very popular archetype in Gods Unchained for a while now, so I'm sure all of you have a good understanding of how it works. It employs a very similar strategy to the other decks that we've been discussing in this video. As you can see from the curve, your goal is to play creatures quickly and often. You're trying to buff your important creatures as well as go wide to facilitate your litany of AoE buff cards. We have a handful of powerful early game creatures for you to start your buffing on. We have two copies of Dryder Sailweaver, which has Ward, so he's hard to remove and therefore good to buff. We have two copies of Vexing Vicar, which has a whole bunch of keywords, so he's a great buff candidate. We have two copies of Vesper, which not only removes your opponent's relics, but has protected, so he's another great buff candidate. And then we have lots of buff cards. 
We have two copies of Blind Martyr, which can buff your entire board's health total so they can take more value trades, which Zulite loves doing. We have Humble Benefactor, which is two bodies for one card and also buffs the health of your existing creatures for more value trades. Two copies of Fellow Genissary to continue to buff up your creatures. We have Intimidating Uplifter for even more creature buff action. Two copies of Militant Theist, which not only can buff your creatures, but it can also destroy opposing creatures like Armor Lurkers, opposing Vickers, um, opposing Shadow Scryers, really any creature with one health that you know protects itself with a keyword. Um, we have Radiant Dawn, which is a great AoE creature buff. It gives everything plus one plus one. It also wakes up your creatures if they're asleep, so you can, you know, destroy your opponent even if they just played a demo. Um, we have Chaining of the Gods, your second AoE buff spell, and I'd like to hone in on this card for just a minute because this is a very powerful spell. However, I see there's like a very common mistake that I see players make all the time with it. So this is a four mana spell with three effects and you get to pick two of them. Um, you can either nerf the strongest creature, minus three, minus two, buff the weakest creature, plus two, plus three, or buff all creatures plus one plus one, and all creatures includes yours and your opponents, of course. And um, a very common mistake I see players make is they'll their first selection will be weaken the strongest creature, and let's say at the time the strongest creature is a black jaguar. That black jaguar will then go to zero one in stats, and then if they picked for their second option, buff the weakest creature plus three plus two, maybe they intended to have their vexing vicar get buffed, but now that they've made that opposing Black Jaguar a 0-1, the Black Jaguar is the new weakest creature, so the Black Jaguar will end up catching the buff. So you want to be very cognizant of the order in which you pick your, um, you know, your two effects, and you want to be cognizant of if you are creating a new weakest creature to buff. So like that's very important if you end up screwing it up. You end up spending four mana throwing away one of your best AoE buff cards to essentially give an opposing creature minus one plus one, which is certainly not worth four mana, and this card is capable of doing a ton of damage to your opponent, so you definitely want to avoid that mistake. And the final buff card is the strongest buff card in the deck with Asterius, a six mana four six with frontline that buffs all of your friendly creatures with two or less strength plus two plus two. And as you can see, all of your creatures naturally have two or less strength, so we will be buffing pretty much all of them. So now that we've discussed the you know various buff cards and like creatures that buff, let's go over the other cards in the deck. Uh, starting off with General Grievous. This is a very strong creature. He's a lot like um, you know, Thundercaller or Dagon, you know, from the other decks that we discussed. It's a three mana creature with a pretty low stat total on its own. It's a three mana two one with Echo, but its effect is it gets plus one plus one after you summon a creature with two or less strength. And just like and like I just said, all of your creatures besides Asterius have two or less strength, so they will all be buffing your General Grievous, and it'll get very big very quickly. So if your opponent doesn't remove it immediately, it'll just get bigger and bigger and harder and harder to remove. And as it grows, it means your board is getting wider. So if it does live for a couple of turns and your opponent does remove it, you'll have a very wide board that you can subsequently capitalize on. He also obviously has Echo, so you can get the 1-mana one 1-1 one, one version of him, which is just another creature that you can buff out of control. You can play them side by side and continue buffing them, so then your opponent has to either deal with both of them in one turn, which could be very difficult, or just get, you know, like, landslided upon. And um, there's one more important card for uh, Budget Zoo Light that I want to go over, and that is Ritual Rod. Ritual Rod as well as Cudgel. Ritual Rod is obviously cheaper because it's a core card and Cudgel is a Genesis card, but this is a very powerful relic for light. It used to see a ton of play. In fact, um, you know, before Lysander Spear existed, it wasn't uncommon to see a Zoo Light deck running two copies of Ritual Rod and two copies of Cudgel. It's just very, very strong for this archetype. It's doing exactly what you want. Right? It's a uh, two attack relic, so you can use your face to trade away up to two of your opponent's creatures. So if you look at the card objectively, it's one mana to eliminate two of your opponent's creatures, which is insane you know, value and tempo. It's exactly what you want for you know, a Zoo Light list. The reason that Cudgels and Ritual Rods have fallen out of popularity is because they compete directly with Lysander Spear, and Lysander Spear is insanely overpowered. No other Light Relic can be played as long as Lysander Spear exists. But if you're a budget player or you don't own Lysander Spear, Cudgel or Ritual Rod are incredibly powerful. And um, Ritual Rod has some nothing effect involving Mystic Creatures. If you don't have Mystic Creatures in your deck, it's no big deal. 
A one mana 2-2 two, two relic is very powerful. Like I said, it's inherently a two for one. If you do happen to have a mystic creature on the board, which I believe the vicar is, you're you know capable of having a one mana 2-3 relic, so you can get rid of three creatures, making it a one mana one for three, which is very, very powerful. And um, Light doesn't have a ton of relics, but Light loves using relics. Like I've been saying throughout this entire video, Light loves making value trades, and using your face to trade is the ultimate value trade because you get to destroy an opposing creature while not doing any damage to any of your existing creatures. So if you're a budget Light player, I definitely suggest adding Ritual Rods or Cudgels or both to your Light list. I think it will greatly improve your win rate. But uh, that is about it for Zoo Light. This archetype may not be as strong as Aggro War, but maybe you're sick of playing Aggro War. Maybe you just love Light. And if you do like light and you want to play on a budget, a list like this could be great for you. And now we are on to zombies. And this is the cheapest of our budget decks so far, coming in at just under $15 USD. And uh, this deck actually functions very differently than the rest of the decks that we talked about. So far, we've only talked about aggro decks. And um, although some players would probably consider zombies an aggro deck, I would refer to it as a gimmick deck. The deck heavily relies on generating zombies through Necroceptor as well as Cursed Obelisk. Your goal in every single game is to hard mulligan for both of these cards and then play them as early as possible. Um, your general strategy will be play one of your one mana creatures on turn one, then pip into one of your gimmick cards, ideally the Necroceptor, go face with whatever one mana creature you played, activating the Frenzy, so you'll be generating with the Necroceptor. If your Frenzy is activated, you'll be generating a 2-2 zombie every single turn. If Frenzy somehow isn't active, you'll generate a 1-1 zombie every turn. Activating Frenzy is incredibly easy because of your 1-mana Soulburn God Power. Um, your other gimmick card is, of course, Curse Obelisk, which is a 3-mana 1-4 with backline. And at the end of your turn, if you're Frenzied, which, as we discussed, will always be the case, you get to generate two 1-1 one, one zombies every single turn. So with both of these cards, you are generating infinite creatures. Your opponent has to get rid of the Relic. It has to get rid of the Cursed Obelisk, or else you are going to just keep making zombies until you inevitably win. The reason you want to start with Necroceptor, ideally, if you do have both in your opening hand, is one Necroceptor will start eliminating creatures, or start eliminating your opponent's access to the Void. Not to the Void, sorry, to the Sanctum. Um, and on top of that, if your Necroceptor is already equipped, it'll help protect your Curse Obelisk even further so it can make better use out of its backline. Um, besides the two gimmick cards, there are a couple of important cards of note. We have Fickle Cambion, um, you know, a three mana card that's just keeping the trend of three mana creature that snowballs alive. So far, all the decks we've discussed has had a three mana creature that snowballs out of control. Um, Zombies is Fickle Cambion. It's a 3-mana three 3-3, three, three, and after your god takes damage, it gets plus 1, plus 1. You can guarantee it gets at least plus 1, plus 1 every single turn with your Soulburn God Power. And this is a creature that just simply cannot be ignored by your opponent. Like, let's say you're playing Hidden Rush Deception against Fickle Cambion. You can't simply ignore the Fickle Cambion the same way you could with, say, a Thundercaller and just outrace them, because every single creature that you send to your opponent's face will be subsequently buffing your opponent's Fickle Cambion. It's very frustrating and get out of hand very quickly. Um, we also have two copies of Curse of Greedon here, which is very strong in the meta right now. Um, like we've discussed this entire video, War likes to play low mana cost creatures and then buff them. Nature buffs low mana cost creature. Light obviously buffs low mana cost creature. And Curse of Greed destroys that creature regardless of what its stat total is. It's very, very powerful. Um, we also have Void Banshee, which is a very strong card for zombie death. It has way more stats than your average 2 mana creature. It has the downside of dealing 4 damage to your god when you play it. However, because your gimmick involves making zombies every single turn and all of those zombies have leech, you should be able to recoup the damage loss from Void Banshee very easily. Um, we also have a copy of Decaying Rhino, which is you know very similar to the Void Banshee. It's simply a very overstated creature. It has the downside of needing to be frenzied or else it deals more damage to itself, but as we've discussed, it's very, very easy to activate frenzy every single turn. Um, we have two copies of Ray of Destruction that destroys any creature, so that's you know Demogorgons, Guild Enforcers, anything. You know, it's easy card to wrap your head around. We have Nether Swarm Lord, which can draw a card if you have Frenzy active. It also buffs all of your nethers, and if you didn't know, zombies are nethers, so this is just a good AoE buff. 
We have two copies of Vampiric Skull, which you can use to get either another copy of Curse Obelisk or another copy of Fickle Campion, two of your most heavy hitting creatures. And then finally, we have the Overseer of Vitality, which you can use to increase the strength of your creatures plus two, uh, plus two attack, so you can you know, overwhelm your opponent. It also um, nerfs two, strength, or two health from your opposing creatures, which could potentially be a board clear. This is essentially just your finisher card. It's very common with zombies, considering you very often have a very wide board, and you're very difficult to defeat because you're always healing every single turn. Um, you know, zombies are definitely not the strongest archetype in the world. That being said, this archetype is very, very easy to play. All you have to do is remember to mulligan for the gimmick cards. And as you can see, this deck is incredibly cheap. So if you're a brand new player and you want to play a deck with a positive win rate without spending too much money, zombies can be a great choice for you. Okay, and our final archetype to discuss, and the only non-aggressive archetype for this video, is Arcane Burst Magic. This is a control-oriented OTK deck revolving around Arcane Burst, as the name would suggest. So let's go over Arcane Burst first. This is a 7 mana spell that deals 1 damage to a source of your choice for each 3 or less mana spell in your void, up to 10 damage. So your goal is to get 10 of those aforementioned spells in your void, play an Arcane Burst for 10 damage, then you play a 0 mana Knowledge, another Arcane Burst for 20 damage, then another 0 mana Knowledge, and the final Arcane Burst making 30 damage and defeating your opponent in just one turn. Um, it's also very important for you to get your uh, Poetic Knowledges to 0. Obviously they are, have a 3 mana casting cost naturally, but you can get them to 0 in two different ways. The easiest way is through Helpful Aether Fox. You can just make it 0 from your hand, and then the more difficult but stronger way is through Form of Wisdom. Form of Wisdom draws you a card, which is good just in general. It also costs 2 mana, so it fits into your combo. But um, if you draw a spell that costs 3 or less mana, you reduce its cost immediately to 0. You can use your Clear Mind God Power to find out what you're drawing, so you can try to guarantee your Form of Wisdom hits your Poetic Knowledge. You can also use your Form of Wisdom in combination with Librarian's Prayer, which is one of your more powerful draw cards in this deck. You only draw one card for 3 mana, but you do get to 4 C6. So you get to curate your next couple of draws for your next couple of turns, which makes it very easy for you to pair your Form of Wisdom with your Poetic Knowledge, making them cost zero, and that way you can just explode with 30 damage and your opponent has no idea when it's coming. Um, let's see, there are a lot of different draw cards in this deck. Obviously it's important for you to draw your combo pieces, it's also important for you to fill up your void with various two-mana spells. We have Dimension Door to draw cards, we have that aforementioned Form of Wisdom, we have two copies of Safeguard Incantation. Demetrios makes you a three or less mana spell that draws you one, two, or three cards. Very powerful. We went over the Librarian's Prayer. We have two copies of All Seeing Spire in here. Um, oftentimes, decks like this run um, Palace's Wand. Palace's Wand is obviously not a budget friendly card, but All Seeing Spire can also potentially draw you a card every single turn. It has order, so it's relatively hard to remove. It requires a spell. And um, the various aggro decks floating around, Zoo Light, Aggro War, Hidden Rush Deception, are going to have a hard time dealing with All-Seeing Spire. That being said, those will be like relatively difficult matchups because they are trying to race you. But more often than not, All-Seeing Spire will be able to draw you multiple cards. Um, besides that, we have various control tools. We have the uh, Form of Power, great for destroying an early, you know, an early curve creature. The Tracking Bolt, which can be some small AoE or just single target removal, Blizzard Bolt. Deals 3 damage, that's pretty easy to understand. Uh, Worm Breath is good for destroying a big creature, or just you know going face if you really need to. We have Unbound Flames, which is you know burst damage as well as AoE. We have two copies of Shape Blast, keep your opponent's board clear. Um, Lay Horde Hatchling, excellent tempo card. It's a creature that destroys an opposing creature, it's very strong. But uh, there is one very important thing to note when playing this deck. Um, like I've been saying this whole video, the most popular archetypes in the game right now are Aggro War, Zoo Light, and Hidden Rush Deception. When you're playing against those aggro decks, your win condition is not dealing 30 damage in one turn. Your win condition is keeping their board clear until they eventually concede. So when you are playing against those aggro decks, you don't need to worry about holding your Poetic Knowledges for the OTK combo. The Poetic Knowledges will be far more useful getting you more copies of Shape Blast, more copies of Unbound Flames, maybe even more copies of Tracking Bolt if you really need it. And uh, then, you know, you'll 
if your opponent doesn't concede, you have far more than just 30 damage available to you in the deck. Obviously, you have two Arcane Bursts, which means with just the combo and the Arcane Burst, you can deal 40 damage. You have the two Unbound Flames, which can deal 4 damage to your opponent's face both times you play it. You can also play it more times if you combo with the Poetic Knowledge. Um, the Worm Breast can obviously go face. The Lay Horde Hatchlings can go face. But it's very important to note that when you are playing against aggro decks this weekend, and you will run into many aggro decks, your win condition is not dealing 30 damage. It's just keeping the board clear, and you, you beat them the way a control deck would win. But if you end up playing against like something like Control War or Control Light, you know anything control oriented, then you fall back on your standard win condition of deal 30 damage at one time. So if you are a budget player and you're sick of the aggro deck, you want to do something a little more controlly, you want to stick it to all those greedy, expensive uh, control decks out there, then a list like this could be a great choice for this weekend ranked event. All right, so it is conclusion time. Which one of these budget decks should you play at this weekend ranked event? Well, in my opinion, you should either go with the Aggro War. This is the most popular aggro deck for good reason. It's very powerful, but if you don't want to go with the War, I think Hidden Rush Deception could also be a very powerful pick. But whatever you go with, try to have fun. Tell us how you did in the TST Discord. Leave a comment on this video, and have a wonderful day. Hey, you! Did you know that subscribing to the TST YouTube channel will increase your win rate by 6.9%? So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. And while you're at it, equip Scythe the Harvest and attack the like button directly in the face. Bye bye